So I'm really delighted to introduce to you our, um, our panelists in alphabetical order. Uh, we'll, uh, do we have any microphone? Yeah. Switch it. Okay, here we go. Um, and they're going to help us sort out fact and fiction uh, in the show of world. So right next to me is Elisa Abrams. She's the director of the Department of Jewish Service Learning at Yeshiva University Center for the Jewish Future. Elisa holds a BA in Judaic Studies from Stern College for Women and a Master's in Social Work from the Wurzweiler School of Social Work. And over the last number of years, um, she's led over 20 different service missions around the world. She sent over 3,000 students on tour tours in addition, she's lectured in the UK and Israel, Brazil, Ukraine, all over North America. And she's a member of the inaugural Wexler Field Fellows Program through the Wexler Foundation. On her right is Rabbi Simcha Feuerman. He serves as the Director of Operations for OHEL, Children's Home and Family Services. He also serves as President of Nefesh International, the Trade Association of Orthodox Mental Health Professionals. In addition, he maintains a private psychotherapy practice where he specializes in high-conflict couples and families. His latest book, which is co-authored with his wife, Chaya Feuerman, is titled Marriage 911, or 911, and is available in bookstores and through Amazon. It's a Kindle book. Next to me, of course, Rabbi Daniel Karopkin, who's the rabbinic leader of the Bait here in Thornhill, Ontario. Rabbi Karopkin received his rabbinic ordination from the Arias Israel College in Baltimore. And he has an MA in Medieval Jewish and Islamic Thought from UCLA's Department of Near Eastern Languages and Cultures. He also has a Master's of Science from Johns Hopkins School of Engineering at the Applied Physics Laboratory. Before moving to Canada in 2011, he was Rosh Kila of Yavna in Los Angeles, and he is the author a new translation of the classic philosophical work of Zari in defense of despised faith. On the far left, Rabbi Shemanya Weissman is the founder of In the Madness, which is a grassroots effort to bring about what he calls sanity back to the shit of the world. He's the author of several books, including the newly published In the Madness, Guide to the Shit of the World. Rabbi Weissman is also the founder of Hot Kiddush, a way for Jews to meet and network online for free. Many of his articles are available at www.hanadiweisman.com. Please welcome our panelists. <laughs> All right, I wanted to really start out with the title here, um, which is the Shinnok Crisis, and I think we should begin with defining the issue. There are a number of writers and figures in the Orthodox world who proclaim uh, Shinnok Crisis. Here's one example of an article that appeared on the OU website. Quote, Treat the topic of singles like the crisis that it is. It is a plague affecting all segments of orthodoxy, and it threatens our very continuity. Synagogues and organizations must put this on the front burner. Singles themselves must change attitudes. Women must put marriage before career. Men must consider the woman as a valued helpmate, not just as a means of advancing their own life goals, be it career or learning. There's more to human beings worth other than their money or looks, end quote. On the other hand, <laughs> see, it's a metaphor. The one mic can't get along with the other mic. <laughs> On the other hand, others have written emphatically that the shit of crisis does not exist. That, in Rabbi Josh Uter's words, it's a collection of myths which only exacerbate the social pressures and anxieties of the core of the Jewish singles community specifically the denial of individuation. So I want each of you to explain, we'll start with Rabbi Karabka, to explain to us what constitutes a shit of crisis. Is there one? Isn't there one? And why are some people in front community so alarmed? Oh my, so I don't know why you're starting with me. I'm the least qualified <laughs> in this panel. I do not have a specialty in the single scene, but we have many singles in our community and we've had a lot of experience over the years. And uh, first, let me just thank our sponsors once again, the Gutmans and the Rosemarys, <coughs> and Torin Motion, and Dr. Malamut, and Rabbi Kelman. Um, does a shit of crisis exist? Well, a crisis is, uh, you know, it's, uh, I guess there's an, it's an age-old philosophical question. 
um, about um, what is reality. <laughs> is this reality exist in my mind or does it exist ontologically outside of my mind? Um, there is a crisis if there's a perception that there's a crisis, and I guess a crisis does exist. If young ladies are crying themselves to sleep at night because no one's responding to their uh, shidduch resume, <coughs> so then we have a crisis. Um, if young men are being, um, are, 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 have misplaced values and are making unreasonable demands on the, the young ladies that they go out with, so then we do have a crisis. But on the other hand, if we have young men and women who are eventually finding their bashert, but um, there are, it just takes a little bit of time, and eventually they figure it out, and sometimes they have to bump into a few walls on the way because they thought that they were going a certain route of the, the, the shidduch process, and they realize that they don't fit in that world and they want to try something else, and eventually they find their way. Then, no, I don't think that necessarily there is a crisis if in the end we have a room full of married people. So I, I do see both sides of the coin, but it's, uh, I, I do think that there's an unnecessary, unnecessary amount of anxiety that has been generated. When a 40-year-old man uh, who's married and has kids realizes that he doesn't like his job very much, he's wondering where his life is going, he doesn't feel very full, full, fulfilled in life, so he goes out and he buys a sports car and he runs away for a little while. What do we call that? A midlife crisis. Is that really a crisis? I don't think so. I think it's overblown. But nobody's offended by the term. Is it a crisis? Is it just a collection of very serious problems? I don't think it matters very much. I think we have bigger things that we can battle on. You know, I, I have very passionate opinions about these issues. This is not one of them that I think really resonates. You know, there are very serious problems. There are real problems. We need to talk about them. We need to address them. What we call it, the precise choice of words that we use to, 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 to refer to these problems is not that important. There are major problems, and the fact is that for every single who desperately wants to get married and is struggling to do so, and the people who care about those singles, it is a crisis, and it's very real for those people. I personally care very much about those singles, so for me, I think it is a crisis. And for anybody who cares about singles, for them it's a crisis. Whether you choose to call it a crisis or not, I don't think that's important. So first, I want to thank you for having me here and the community. Thank you for hosting us. Um, so by a show of hands, please, who here got married after age 22? Thank you. Who here has a child that's still single? And um, who here is involved or considers themselves involved with Shadokim? Okay, great. Um, thank you. That was a very helpful. Um, when I hear the word crisis, and you might recognize me because I'm the girl in the video, I look a little different now, my hair is different. Um, I, I said there were, it. There are a lot of girls in the video. <laughs> <laughs> I was one of the girls. I said the belly roll line. Oh, that's oh, that's oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> the first time I saw that video at a conference, everyone walked up to me and just went, oh, belly roll. Um, so, anyways, um, in terms of the crisis, uh, as I said in the video, and I'll, and I'll say it now, and I'll, I'll say it for years. Every time someone uses their word crisis, it makes me feel worse about myself. What is going on in Nigeria right now is a crisis. There are 200 girls that are missing. My friends and I that are not married, that are close to 30 or over 30, that's unfortunate. Um, and, and I do feel that it's, it's a sad thing that we're not married yet, but we need fulfilling lives, we need happy lives, and we're not crying ourselves to sleep. Maybe there's the night every now and then that you do, because I think everyone does. But it's not a crisis. But our community has told us that it's a crisis. Mm -hmm. And our community has made us feel that it's not OK that we graduated college and we didn't get married, or that we're living in a singles community for over five, six, 10 years. And that's where the crisis lies. It's it's the lack of sensitivity and the words that are used that makes us question who we are and where we're standing in our lives. Sure. Now, I'm just reacting to the, uh, the first quote that yeah, you stated. And I think in, when, when people experience the uh, times of social change and, and the impact uh, and the chaos and confusion that comes from the changing of roles, 
uh, the changing of requirements, changing of the rules of the game, which are all going on at a more and more rapid pace because of technology, I think there's a very strong drive to, to want to move toward traditional values. And I think that the article is out of context, so I don't know what else the person was saying, but clearly those, those sentences, the person was in a very reactive state, and he wants everybody to go back 100 years uh, to, some, to some place that might not have actually felt better for anybody, but from where we're standing, it certainly looked a lot more romantic and interesting. And I think that that's a very big challenge, and we all are inhabitants of, of a world that's in transition, and times are in tra transition, and for sure, that means that the music's going to stop, and some people are going to be left without a chair. Whether you're talking about the job market, because the world is changing, or you're talking about the shit-off market, because the world is changing, and the demands that are going on are very, very different. And so, you know, whether it's a crisis or not, again, everybody has meditated on that word, but certainly there's a lot of pain, and there's a lot of difficulty in understanding the roles, and understanding the rules of the game, and trying to figure out um, what chair you're going to take when the music you know, actually, actually stops. I think that, very similar to divorce, you have to think about this for a moment, to digest what I'm saying, but very similar to divorce, the reason why there are more singles, and the reason why there's more divorce is simply because they can. They can. We have more choice today. And that means that people can choose to leave relationships that they're not happy in. Now, I'm not making moral judgment about whether that's a good choice or a bad choice. Uh, my bread and butter is trying to save marriages and really not in favor of divorce, but the reality is that many people leave relationships because they have an option to do so. And many people stay single because they have an option to do so. That doesn't mean that I'm blaming anybody at all. Uh, what I'm trying to say is that the more choices there are and the less restrictions there are on the roles, actually in some ways the more imprisoning it is. It's very difficult to make choices and the thought of choosing a marriage partner or quote settling is very similar to the idea of people being in a marriage that, that's loveless but they used to stay together and now they don't. And so there are very complex, not one size fits all answers to these questions, certainly. And it requires a lot of study and I think it requires a lot of work with, with the, the people that we know to, to help them figure out the rules of the game. But uh, in that sense, I think there's a crisis because there's a shifting. There's a shifting in almost every which way that we live. And that's what makes uh, life very stressful for us today. That's actually a, a kind of a curious paradox that you're, you're alluding to here. And I think that's part of my confusion. What's a paradox? See, on the one hand, you're talking about a truth, which is that modernity is about autonomy. It's about choice. It's about people freely individuating their lives. But the material on the film, and the material that sort of has come my way in researching this topic is about no choice, right? It's about the idea that the system seems much more restricted, more confined. When you talk about history, everybody sort of knows or spoke to somebody who's sort of articulated this idea that, and Gail Hockman on the film talked about this, there was a time when people just met each other, there was a time where you got a phone number and you, <coughs> and you went out on a date, you decided whether you liked the person, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And yet what we're hearing now is that the system is actually much more constricted, not about choice. So there seems to be a kind of internal contradiction taking place here. I'm wondering if you could weave that out for me. Well, I think that the community is reacting to having so much choice, and therefore, you know, for example, uh, right today, there's, there's much more anxiety disorders, not just in the religious community. Um, there's actually mixed, mixed studies about whether or not religious people are more anxious, but in the world at large, there's a lot more prevalence of anxiety disorders. Um, and part of the reason of that is very similarly, if you have your primary needs taken care of and you're not worried about getting eaten by a saber-toothed tiger or getting attacked by, by a cassock or whatever it is, uh, you, you, you then have this free-floating kind of anxiety that's almost biological and existential and you have nothing to attach it to. And so you start fretting or you start becoming more religious or you start paying attention to details that nobody worried about. And so, to a certain degree, I think that's part of the game. If I could share, I don't want to go, talk too long, but uh, thank God I was, my wife and I were successfully able to, to witness the marrying of two of our older children. And 
it was a very difficult time, you know, the shit of process. And we're also sort of, we don't belong in a particular category because in terms of our mode of dress and our practice, we would, I would say we're, we consider ourselves yeshivas. But our attitudes are socially progressive. My wife is a therapist, I'm a therapist. You know, our attitudes are very much socially progressive. So we, uh, uh, I was, by more than one person over the two or three years I was trying to help my daughter get married, was accosted. How could you, how could you insist that you're not going to support your son-in-law? It was, uh, people literally grabbed us in the street and predicted doom. And actually, all that we said was that we wanted, we were very proud to have a son-in-law who wants to study Torah. We just simply are not making any promises. We just would have to take it from month to month, as the good Lord would, would allow. And this one thing was like seismic. People stopped us on the street and kind of practically threatened us with that our daughter would never get married. She got married to actually a very, very uh, bright fellow who now is in you know, podiatry school, but he's a big town of too. But the point is that it was crazy, the pressure was insane. I don't know what it was coming from. We weren't even telling anybody what to do. We just were saying, no thank you, we're not willing to talk about money before marriage. <laughs> That's all we said. We just said those words and people were driving us crazy. So there's something going on. I don't know what it is. It worked out for us, but. Um, Lisa, um, let's talk about looks, okay, because, um, you know, for me this was kind of anthropology I was learning about, I was sort of treating this like there's people here in a world called Shidduch, and it struck me that the elephant in the room was always looks, and money. You know, everybody was talking about me note and X, Y, and Z, but what I kept seeing was looks and money, and this was sort of reiterated for me in a quite a well-known column. Uh, that was printed two years ago by a woman named Nita Halberstam. I'm just going to quote you a little bit from it. I found it quite startling, and I think you will too. But once you get past your reaction, I'd be interested in whether you think this is truth. She wrote a column on Shaduchim, and she writes as follows, quote, Yes, it is somewhat disillusioning that men <clears throat> dedicated to full-time Torah learning possess what these girls might perceive are superficial values, but brass tacks, they want a spouse to whom they are attracted. The young men themselves might be too shy or ashamed to admit it, but their mothers won't hesitate to ask what for some is the deal maker, deal breaker question. Quote, is she pretty? Unquote. Mothers, this is my plea to you. There's no reason in today's day and age with a panoply cosmetic and surgical procedures available. <laughs> Why any girl can't be transformed into a swan. Borrow the money if you have to. It's an investment in your daughter's future, her life. I'm not actually done. <laughs> so, my dear sweet mothers who are bristling with indignation at my thesis and feel deeply offended by my proposition, got that right. Please do not be hurt by what I am suggesting. I truly want to help. If your daughter should have prospects are being hampered by a flaw or problem that can be banished or remedied, please give her the emotional and financial support to correct it. Yes, I know we all want to be cherished for who we are inside, but whether we like it or not, appearances do count. So this article engendered a good deal of reaction and much of it was understandably negative. But others, you know, the woman from Fairlawn, Gail Hoffman, in the film actually wrote in saying she thinks she's right. She wrote in and said that although it's very unpalatable, it is reality and we ignore it at our peril. So my question to all of you is as follows. Of course, we all acknowledge that attraction is important, but also that it's subjective. She's making more radical propositions, like we really have to swallow our pride and Go for it. What do you think? So you know how there are things that you think but you don't say out loud? That's one of those. Um, <laughs> in my opinion. Uh, look, I, I'll be honest. I, I'm somebody who always struggled with my exterior, my appearance, and, and to, am I pretty enough? Am I thin enough? Am I good enough? Am I tall enough? Am I too tall? Am I this or am I that? Um, and it always weighed on me. It still does. Um, but to make a comment that girls should, or that mothers should borrow money to have their daughters get plastic surgery 
is really reinforcing a very unhealthy uh, sense of self. Um, but I would be lying if I said that both men and women don't care about looks. We all are attracted to people, and we all know what we like and what we don't like. And it is, it is important that people put their best foot forward. I myself, earlier this year, I had done, I was on a Hishtadlis kick. I have a sister who's nine years younger than me that's getting married in Shem at the end of June. And so while she was about to get engaged, I was like, okay, I gotta work on this. And I went and met with three different Shabchanim. And they were reviewing my profile, and they said, wow, you are so much prettier in person. You have to change your picture. Yeah, it's so good to see you too. Um, now, I chose that picture because I thought that I looked good in that picture. So after the first shot said that, I got upset, probably cried a little bit. The second shot and I was like, okay, that's twice in one week, fine. Third shot and I said, that's it. I'm, I'm creating an event. I am taking over a hair salon. I'm hiring a photographer. I'm hiring makeup artists. I put together a whole day, a whole pamper yourself, whatever you want to call it day. Uh, advertise it through Why You Connect, advertise it to my friends, and three girls signed up. Now, I was shocked because I thought to myself, here it sounds like such a fun girls' day out. Why wouldn't anybody want to get their hair and makeup done and get their picture taken? And I realized that there was two things that were going on. People are comfortable with how they look, and they don't want to be told that they don't look good. Now, that doesn't mean that they should go out schlumpy and not looking nice, but if we tell somebody, you really don't look the way you should, not only does she feel terrible about herself, but that's not gonna help her ego in general be a healthy person in a relationship because she's always gonna be thinking, well, what does he think? Does this look okay? Does that look okay? Or does she, what does she think? Do I look okay or not? And it's it's a really unfortunate way that we're treating it. And I'll, and I'll end with this quickly. This morning when I was at the gym, and I go to the gym at 6.15 in the morning so that I can be healthy. And there was a clip on TV of a show that was a, basically like a three minute reel of this relationship between two characters. And it was so romanticized and so not real. And yet I found myself thinking, huh, maybe that'll happen to me one day. And that's the problem is that we're so, um, you know, we're so influenced by the media and by the non-Jewish perspective on books and relationships that it, it infiltrates into who, into who we are and the, and the emphasis that we put on these things. And I think, like Gail said, you know, Mr. Shem, people are going to have children. They're not going to be the same size when they get married. But people can't really think fast forward to that. But everyone has to put their best foot forward, but be realistic in that people are really beautiful in different ways. <laughs> Physical beauty has been a criterion for matches from the times of the Talmud. You know the story, I've mentioned it from the pulpit for people who are members here, that on two ba'av, girls would go out into the field in white dresses and dance before the young bacharim. I lament the good old days. Today that could never happen because the rabbis would not allow it. The problem, however, is, is that the Gemara says that there were girls who were quite attractive. The girls who were attractive would make a point of saying, Ain't Isha el that the purpose of a woman is for, her, is for her external beauty. And the Gemara acknowledges that when a man has a beautiful wife, it gives him harchabat adat, it gives him a certain sense of menucha, of a machaya, a nice home, a, a beautiful wife. Those are things that actually ameliorate and enhance a person's life. So the fact to suggest that that's not a criterion, it's not a consideration at all, that's simply not true. To make that the number one criterion and to say that a person should artificially alter their appearance, that's a distortion as well. There was at some point, one point, I don't know if it still exists, in New York, a very serious problem with anorexia among the girls in, in, the, in, the, in, the, um, in, in certain communities in New York. And obviously, that's a distortion. When it becomes the number one criterion, when it becomes overemphasized, that's wrong. And I have to tell you that perhaps in one end of the, of the orthodox spectrum, it's overemphasized. But it's also not good to feel so comfortable with yourself that you're not willing to take beauty tips. My wife, uh, who's involved with Shiduchim, and uh, has offered some tips to some young ladies who have come to meet her and uh, quite frankly have looked a little schlumpy. I have to tell you, and if you think I'm shallow, I'm sorry, but this is what I feel. I looked at the video and I saw some of the girls. One girl had oily hair. I wouldn't want to set her up with my son. I'm, not, I'm sorry for saying that, but you know, if you're going to be on video, 
you should prepare for it. Another girl was a little bit Zoptic. That's not a problem. But she wasn't dressed in a way that she, and her hair was not made up in a way that would make her, you know, put forward her best foot as far as in the appearance department. Everyone has a good feature. For some, it's their eyes. For some, it's their nose, whatever, their jawline, whatever it is. But every girl, and to some extent the boys as well, should go through some level of education as far as how you make yourself over to make yourself presentable for a show. Very few people are going to marry somebody that they don't find physically attractive, and I think that's a good thing. Every woman should feel that the man that she's married to thinks that she's the most beautiful woman on earth, and every man should feel that his wife thinks he's the most handsome person on earth. And they're probably both wrong, and that's okay. It's fine. This is part of the nature that God put into human beings. And we all understand when somebody goes on a job interview that they dress differently than when they're going to the beach or when they're going out with their friends for pizza. We just understand that. And it's okay that to, to educate people that when they go out on dates, they have to pay a little bit more attention to how they appear on the dates. Now, I think it's very easy to, to knock uh, the author of that article for going to some you know, wild big, big, big extremes here. I think we're all basically on the same page with that. But at least in principle, it does make sense that people should be educated that looks do matter, the way you, you know, show yourself to others matters, and there's really nothing, nothing wrong with that in principle, just how far we're willing to go with that. I don't have a problem with that. But one thing I will say is that if a similar article was written that was not knocking the women, but knocking the men, saying men are a bunch of schlumps and losers and they don't know how to dress, I don't think it would get quite the same criticism from people. I think that... Uh, that's uh, something that, that rankles me. That uh, even even in that video that we saw, everybody was knocking the guys. The guys were knocking the guys. Oh, there's not enough good guys out there. The women are also wonderful. The guys are a bunch of losers. You know, why don't more people find find that offensive? I don't think guys are losers. I know plenty of wonderful single men who are educated, have good personalities, and make wonderful husbands and fathers. They're not losers. There are plenty of great guys out there. There are plenty of great women out there. We don't have to knock the genders. There's really no no need for that, and I, I, I think women often get a free pass and get all the sympathy. There's plenty of good guys out there that are also having a difficult time. Yeah, yeah that uh, some of this is obviously about Western influence, as we all know. There's a tremendous amount of focus on looks and appearance, and. Uh, the programming is is so nonstop, and it doesn't matter what community you're from. You could be from an extremely, uh, you know, sheltered and uh, uh, restricted community. Um, it's just a matter of how you play the game. So you, you cover certain parts and you reveal other parts. You know, there's a Gemara in Shabbos that goes into all the different types of dress and makeup because it has to do with carrying on Shabbos. But inadvertently, they talk about a locale where the women cover everything except for one eye. And that one eye is heavily made up. You know, so it doesn't matter which community you're from, you really can't be uh, completely free from the you know, westernized influences. And anorexia, by the way, in the last couple of years, is on the rise in men. Because as, as time goes on, the, you know, the effects, the, the pernicious influence of you know, focusing on the body and the superficiality and insecurity, uh, which is really a place for the free-floating anxiety to attach to, does end up, you know, and it, it progresses. So Ben is trying to go through this too. There's, there's a couple of things I want to say about this. First of all, the Torah is not politically correct. Uh, it doesn't really care about being politically correct. And in fact, all the imamos and many of the others were described as yifas Torah and yifas Torah. And it was mentioned as a virtue. Uh, it is a virtue to be beautiful. What that really means, it, it requires you know, quite a bit of thought. But, but clearly there is something to that. So if that's what the author of the article is saying, the more power to her. Because sometimes a person needs to be told. It's not only about looks, it can be about character. If someone is not getting married after a couple of years, they should get objective feedback. You know, what am I doing that's throwing people off the trail if I am doing anything? You, you know, what's going on? It could be looks, it could be mannerisms. Sometimes people need that feedback. So, you know, I'm all for that. I'm all for people trying to look good. I'm obviously not all for putting, uh, you know, 18-year-old girls under the knife so that they could, uh, you know, boost their status. But uh, I think it's important not to, you know, not to beat around the bush on this issue. 
I just want to go back to a word that you used, distortion. Because I think, you know, you talk about looks, you talk about other things they talk about in the film. Uh, a lot of it seems to revolve around this notion of distortion. Like, I'm wondering, how do we get to this place today, and I'm just basing it on what I'm reading and, and I'm watching, where we're talking about tablecloths, and we're talking about plates, and we're talking about pictures, and we're talking about sizes of dresses. You know, when when all of us, I mean, I'm assuming I speak for many of us, like when we dated, we didn't we didn't talk about that. I, didn't, I, I certainly didn't talk about that. I talked about my existential anxieties and so on. Well work out for you. Well <laughs> <laughs> um, but you, you understand what I'm saying. Like how do we get to this place? And I know I'm, I'm gonna ask Robert Weiss going to speak in a minute, because I know you talk about this in, in your book, there's a kind of historical arc that's taken place here. And I really want to know, like, how did we get to this place of, like, you know, pictures and plates and bios and fax resumes, and nobody seems to actually date. There, there, it seems to be this kind of orchestrated, almost like a play, right? And uh, how do we get there? Well, well first of all, I, I think it's very important to distinguish, as has already been done tonight, between the two uh, different ends of orthodoxy. The yeshivish orthodoxy, which is very strict about the resume and about the shidduch process, and the other end, which is more uh, 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 which is more tolerant of the social outlets, where resumes and these kinds of superficial um, requirements are not as emphasized because young men and women are allowed to meet each other in a much more open atmosphere. So if you're asking, uh, uh, you know, from, from the yeshivish side, sure. I think that number one, um, these I think were they were coming originally from a good place. Um, there, but distortions take place because no one has bothered to speak up and say stop the madness, except I guess for Rabbi Weissman. Mm -hmm. But in the yeshivish world, people are, are very selective in the das Torah that they seek out. It's just it's just the reality. If it's Das Torah that resonates with me, so then that's Das Torah that comes from our Sinai. But if it's not, it's, if, it's, if it's something that someone, a Rosh Hashiva will say that I don't particularly like or agree with or it's too difficult, so then that's someone else's Rosh Hashiva that doesn't resonate with me. And that's how distortions take place. I think the, 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 the grossest distortion in the Yeshiva world is the expectation that, that are, is given to young ladies and to young men that when you get married, it's a requirement for the young lady and for her family to support the young man in learning. That was never the value until the 20th century. And it was never something that was expected. And for some very bizarre reason, that has become, in many communities, the norm. That, to me, is the biggest problem, the financial burden that has been placed on the young girl and her family, which is creating an onerous, onerous burden. I, I think the reason why people ask these kinds of questions is because they think it's a good idea and they think that it will give them some insight or some information as to whether this should have really make sense. If people don't think these questions are a good idea, they should stop asking them, they should find better questions, and when people ask them those types of insane questions, they should uh, you know, say, I don't want to go out with somebody who asks these types of questions. The fact that you ask me that question tells me a lot more about you than you'll learn about me from my answer. That's really the way things are going to change. It's all about social pressure. People feel pressure to answer these questions. People feel pressure to go along with the system. People feel pressure to have these resumes, 80% of which says nothing about them, by the way. If somebody gave me one piece of paper to talk about myself, I wouldn't spend 80% of it talking about my relatives and other people. I would use it all about myself. That's just what I would do. I don't have a resume for this, by the way. But if I did, in theory, I would use it all to talk about me. Most resumes are not like that. It's about choices people make. What side of yourself do you, do you want to show people? Are you, are you confident in yourself and who you are that you can be real with other people? Instead of putting on a mask, trying to live up to some image that nobody can clearly outline, but this is the way you're supposed to be to fit in this power of neutral person who doesn't have opinions, who doesn't have a personality, who doesn't have dreams and goals that are different than the next person's, who doesn't have opinions, who doesn't have flaws, just this power of neutral thing, but you're really wonderful. If that's not who you are, then don't be that way. That's not that's not the way you'll find the person who's right to spend life with. You, you have to be real. 
But I think people need to choose to not answer these questions, and they need to choose to throw these questions back to people who ask them, saying, how, how dare you ask that? You know, that's really not at all appropriate, and I wouldn't date somebody who was so petty and so shallow to ask that type of question. And if enough people have the confidence and the true faith in God to do that, then that will turn the social pressure around, and that will cause positive change instead of negative change. You know how when a little child takes his father's car keys, puts on his hat, puts on his jacket, and he has all these totems of manhood, and he feels like he's like his father, uh, even though he's really not, but as a child, he, he assumes if you hold the keys to the car, the magical keys to the car, and you wear the magical hat, you are magically something important. I think the, the Orthodox Jewish community, particularly the yeshiva community, has kind of fallen into that developmental trap. I think that, uh, you know, Orthodox Judaism after World War II was probably something like a startup company. A lot of people were no longer here. It was a small, intimate group, and they had a major task of rebuilding. And they took a lot of pieces and put it together in an informal way, and it really worked well. But, you know, as, as all startup companies, once you reach a certain level of growth, you can't maintain informal policies anymore. And you can't fly by the seat of your pants. Things start to fall apart. And I think that's what we're starting to see. So they, they made a lot of ideas that the concept are based on real things, but they're, it, it became distorted and almost a caricature. Like a child thinks being an adult is wearing a hat and holding a car key. It's not about being responsible or earning a living. And it, funny choice, right? Not about being responsible or earning a living. I think, I think that there's a lot of, of, of that kind of mimicry of Torah values that on the one hand, if you're not looking at it too closely, it looks like it's real, but then it's not real. See, there's a true group of Moshe. Somebody asks him, the great part about Rav Moshe is people would ask him the craziest things and he would answer. He was a very patient man, like Hillel. He would answer the questions. So someone asked him, is it a problem with Sneas if you're going out with a girl and you ask her to make a meal for you because maybe it's a problem with Sneas, she's making a meal for you, but you want to see if she's a good cook. This is a question somebody asked, I don't know when, 60 years ago, whatever. And, but he patiently answers the question. He actually weighs and measures some of the halakhic issues involved, which is not for today's conversation. But in the end, he makes a comment. And he says, let me tell you something. You really shouldn't be trying too hard. He said, basically, you, you check out the family and see if they have similar values to your family. And, you, and the person should be pleasing to your eye. And uh, the rest is you go out a few times because we're the fish and that's our job was to go out a few times. And then you'll be successful. Hashem will bless your actions. Very profound. Very simple, very profound. Uh, you know, if only it worked for everybody that way, but that was his advice. And I think that that's, in theory, the dance that people are trying to do. They want to find out about the family and the values, which makes sense. They want to see somebody who's attractive and, 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 and feel that attraction. That makes sense. But somehow or another, it's been blown up and exaggerated in this distorted way. And people are mimicking a process that's not authentic. And uh, you know, that's, that's my comment here. Just ask a question. Like, really? <laughs> you see a person, you check out the family, you go out a few times, and that's it? That doesn't seem strange to you? I, like, I understand you don't want to go out and like, live with a person for five years, but like, what happens to a process where you actually spend <laughs> time, not two dates, and actually talk about real things, and why like, oh, not, like real people, like falling in love, like, it, it seems very odd to me that that would be a paradigm for Jewish dating. I mean, I think it really depends. See, his comment is very telling. In the Tshuva, he says, we're Lindish, we go out a few times, that's our shtablis, right? That's our effort. That means that each community has its norm of what's considered its effort. Now, if Moshe came from a Russian town in Uban, by the way, it's very interesting, his first psalm that he ever made was how to spell Luban and get. Now you have to understand, in Luban, do you think the same people lived there for 500 years? They lived and died in the same town? How could they not have known how to spell Luban and get? The answer was, there probably wasn't a get written in 500 years before the Bolshevik Revolution and all the social change. But anyway, he lived simply. So obviously today things are more complex. So you don't go out three times. They go out 20 times, and your conversations about trying to understand each other's values and your goals. But you don't have to quetch and go out for four years either to understand that. That's, that, that's my point. 
So I'm going to just talk briefly about the resume. Um, I don't think you can fight the system. I think you need to have a resume. I think that it's the easiest way to get your information out there and for people to share. Um, I have a girl, I have a guy, let's talk about it. Uh, the challenge is making your resume stand out, which is kind of similar to applying for a job. Um, if you can, can I just kind of, I don't know about this stuff, yes. describe the resume to me. Like how long is it, what's on it? Sure, so similar to real life, you want it to be one page. Um, I'll, I'll break it down for you. Alisa Abrams, uh, hometown, Teaneck, New Jersey, um, uh, or sorry, location of parents, Teaneck, location currently, Washington Heights, um, high school, Maya Nope, seminary, Midrash Moria, Stern College, Wurzweiler. So now you know where I'm at, at school. Um, my siblings, which is crucial to who I am, Dina, married to Moshe, three children, David, not married, Brooke, engaged. Okay, um, a little bit about Lisa now. Alisa lives in Washington Heights, she works for Yeshiva University, and um, she enjoys spending her time volunteering, and in addition, she's known for making the best challah in Washington Heights. Smiley face. Now, why did I include that? Because I needed to jump off the page, because clearly, you see, I have a bit of a personality, but I don't think that if someone's shuffling through papers, they're going to see who I am. So I include also, I would like to live in Israel one day, I have an open home, I host a lot of meals, etc. And I try to include as in briefly as possible the 30 years of my life so that people can maybe try and understand who I am. So that's what a should have resume is. <laughs> um, and, and I'll just say though that the, the fact that we have to put ourselves onto paper is really hard because people think that they're marrying a paper and not a person sometimes and they get very hung up on the on the nuances of certain words that are used and things the way that they're written or listed and that's where people just say no and we've all been to a Jewish wedding, we've all been to a smorgasbord, first you make your way around the room then you decide what you're going back to, that's how dating is. Uh, you look through your pile, okay maybe this one, maybe this one, eh, maybe not that one, okay find this one and, and the problem is that the stack gets higher and higher and so you go out with less and less. And that's the problem with the resumes, but you can't fight it. You have to have one. Every time I go to a sport now, I really think about should do it. Let's talk a little bit, all of us, about some of the other parties involved that have been mentioned here. Uh, obviously, Shakhani, parents. I, I'd like you to clarify for me um, uh, what's, the, what's the role of a Shakhan, actually? Um, in other words, what are the, some of the misconceptions that we have about their role? Um, in the course of doing research for this, I spoke to a number of parents, and parents seem to complain a lot about Shachanin. Um, they seem they're frustrated by their conversations with them. And then the Shachanin I spoke to said they're all frustrated with the conversations they have with the parents. Um, so why is this happening? Well, what, what's the Shachan actually supposed to do? Um, I, I know that sounds like a stupid question, a person's supposed to put the two people together, but what, what further are they supposed to do? Go ahead, yeah. Okay, great. Um, so first and foremost, the Shachan needs to listen. They really need to listen to what the person is saying that they're interested in meeting in terms of another person. Um, I've found that sometimes the Shachan will say, well, tell me the last person you went out with. Um, clearly that did not work, so I'm not really sure why I need to give that as an example. Um, the other challenge is, I find, I've, I've been invited to sit in Shidduchim uh, meetings, and I'm not not Shidduchim, but I'm just going to share one vignette. And I heard Shatim say, I cannot set that guy up with that girl. It's just not, it's just, she's not the right look for him. I'm sorry, why are you deciding what he should be dating? It, it, it doesn't matter what your opinion is of her look. Let them meet. If you think everything else matches up, then go for it. I can probably say that Baruch Hashem, I've made four shidduchim, and I've been very fortunate, and I'll tell you a story about a shidduch that I made. And it happens to be that one of the people is in the video. I had two friends that had met at a singles event, and the girl actually contacted me and said, I'm kind of interested in this guy, can you reach out to him? So I reached out to him, and I said, hey, uh, this girl is interested in you. Oh, sorry, I did not say that first. I said, hey, I have an idea. Because right, we all have to pretend that no one's interested in you to have the idea. <laughs> we all know, come on. So I called him and I said, um, I'd like to say you up with this girl. He hems and haws and goes, I don't really know. And I was like, why? And we were friendly enough that I could push him. I said, why don't you want to go out with her? She's a great girl. She comes from a great family. She's funny. I don't really want to tell you. No, you know what? We're friends. 
I need you to explain to me why you don't want to go out with her. She's not my look. Okay, I have to think she's a lot more attractive than you are, but talk to me about this. He goes, she's just not my look. I said, can I tell you something honestly? She actually asked me about you. She did? Let me get back to you. Precious Jen, they're now married for five years, they have a kid. After their third date, he called me and he said, if any guy ever gives you a hard time, tell him to call me first. <laughs> now, I'm not saying that that's a perfect example, um, but I think that sometimes there needs to be a little bit of nudging by shotgun. However, that in the scenario when a girl, and I'm only talking as a woman, as a, when a girl or a woman, whatever, says, I'm not interested in going out. And even if the guy wants to go out with her again, she shouldn't be made to feel bad for not wanting to go out again. I know myself better than anyone knows me. And if I didn't feel comfortable on that date, or I don't find that that person is right for me, I'm entitled to that. And I think that a shadchan should play the role literally of Yenta the matchmaker, where they say, I met this person, I met this person, this is a really nice idea. They can go as the in-between and you can ask them questions, but they shouldn't be forceful because yes, you're a shadchan, shkayach, but you're not, you're not me and you weren't on that date and you weren't there when the guy didn't open the door or he, he said something really weird and uncomfortable. And that's what people have to remember. And it's, it's so frustrating being a shadchan because I've been a shadchan also, even though I'm single. But people shouldn't give up because you never know where you're going to meet someone and who you can introduce somebody to. First of all, I just want to acknowledge, I know we have at least one or two shatchanim. I know Grace uh, Weltman is here. She's a shatchan for our community. If you're a shatchan, would you raise your hand? Okay, so if anyone would like to meet these people, I'm sure that they'll be here. And you have Sasa Basimcha that's here as well. And so that's a good thing. And these are the people that should really be answering these questions maybe when we do some Q&A. I want to talk about parents for just a second. Um, there are, uh, I believe, first of all, it's all it, it's a product of age, how much a parent should get involved with the shachan and with their children's shiduchan. Obviously, if a young lady is 18 or 19 years old, parents will get more, are, it's appropriate for parents to get more involved in speaking with the shachan. If the young lady is 23, 24, or older, I don't think it's appropriate anymore for the parents to be as deeply invested or involved with the shotgun. I do have to tell you that I know of cases, um, my, uh, Karen was very involved, my wife was very involved with a case, where the, the young lady called my wife, she's over that age, she's definitely a mature adult, she's in her late 20s, and the mother got involved. And the mother, when Karen had recommended a young man, the mother called, asked him very, um, very, very uh, detailed questions and raised several objections. And Karen said, but they should meet. The boy's a good boy. I wouldn't set up your daughter with someone who's not a good boy. Let them just meet first. We, we both realized that we would be doing a disservice to the young man by setting up this girl with him because he would have the sugar from hell. <laughs> and you need to know when you, when you, you need to know when to let go. And I, I will tell you this, and I get it too when fathers call me from out of town inquiring about a young man from our community. It's perfectly appropriate for a father to know, to want to know, um, are the young man or the young woman's uh, parents, are they married, are they divorced, are the guys, are the father spending time in jail, you know, all of these things, if there's a story behind the family or there's a stigma, those are things that are appropriate for a parent to discuss. The personality of the guy and his future ambition, careers, goals, aspirations, likes, dislikes. Let your child discuss that with the shachin and stay out of it. The role of the shachin is um, if you have a Jew living in the shtetl somewhere and there are no women in his village or any of the neighboring villages, he wants to get married, the role of the shachin is to help him find a lady in a distant village and make an introduction. How we reached a state today where singles can be living, concentrated in a few square blocks, dominating in the same shul, and the only conceivable way that they can ever meet each other and get married is if they go on the internet, on the middle-aged Reviton, they ask the silly questions and set them up, is mind-boggling to me. I have no idea. I can't even saw in this video, a very nice lady talking about how when she was young, 
People went out, they met each other, they had friends, they met through their friends, they met through their social activities, and unfortunately it doesn't exist anymore. I expected the next words out of her mouth to be, I'm going to create such opportunities. But no, I'm part of a Shidduch group. The light bulb didn't go on. What's stopping people from being normal? What's stopping people from doing what worked for their parents and their grandparents for generations? I have news for you. It's a myth that the Shadrach was the predominant way for singles to meet throughout Jewish history. It's a myth. People met in shul. People met through families. People met through friends. Some people met through a Shadrach, but it was not the only way. It's not the Torah way. It's not the predominant way. It's not really the best way if there are alternatives. And there are alternatives, and there should be alternatives. So there is a role for the shotgun. They can help some people. I would question the methods that shotgun use. There's a lot to talk about in terms of that. But there is a role for good shotgun to play, but they shouldn't be running the show. There's really no reason for it. There's no reason for singles to count on shotgun as a crutch, as the only conceivable way that they can be people. It doesn't make any sense to me. Okay, um, I think it would be helpful for some people perhaps to meet the Shadchan in attendance. I think it would also be helpful for, for people to turn to somebody in the same row who they have not yet met and introduce themselves. I think that would be a nice idea as well. I just wanted to briefly redirect to you um, because Rabbi Throckman talked about parents and you do a lot of high conflict uh, couples therapy. And I'm sure that part of the conflict is organized around the parents. And I wonder if you could just spend a moment from your perspective um, doing the work you do to talk about what you think is a good way for parents to be involved and in what ways can parental involvement be dysfunctional? Well, I think that the, uh, there's, a, uh, there's a Russian psychologist, his name was Vygotsky, who uh, uh, when I was in school, we didn't learn about him because he was behind the Iron Curtain. But he talks about something called the zone of proximal development, which is this idea that good development happens when children, really organisms, it's not only about children, but are exposed to, to challenges that are just in the right zone, that, that they aren't over, overwhelming and they aren't either uh, you know, completely being sheltered. And I think that that's the job of a good parent. It's, he calls it scaffolding, like you put a scaffold around the building. So if you want your children to develop healthy relationships, it certainly doesn't start when they're going out on Shaduk. Uh, and it starts from, from the earliest times of, of, their, of their formation of their personality. Uh, when siblings have conflict, how do the parents moderate the conflict? Do they step in and run the show? Do they encourage communication? Do they encourage problem solving skills? So these are the kinds of things. I think parents are, 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 are facilitators. Parents are showmen. I always took objection to people who go, go over to us in shul and they see uh, one of our children who might be in one way particularly charming or attractive and say, oh, so, so does he belong to you? And I would say, uh, no, he does not belong to me. Uh, I was entrusted with him for a while, which I hope we're doing a good job with. I think parents are, 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 are facilitators. So there's many things that parents can do that can facilitate the growth, the judgment uh, of their children. After they're married also, it's a little more complicated. They have to be much less involved uh, and not put pressures on them. They don't realize that sometimes their little requests to see on the outside like nothing to a newly married couple could be seismic. So putting pressure on them to fit some kind of role of coming to your house for Yom Tiv or Shabbos or calling you while they should do that from their point of view, you don't know what their shown bias challenges are, you don't know what their pressures are, and you have to give couples a lot of space. There's many things to parents can do. It's really, it's really endless. Can we just stay on this for a minute? Um, the people who come into your office, let's say they're newly married, what sorts of fantasies do you think people have about marriage, like number one, that are damaging to them? And sort of, what's the best piece of advice you could give to somebody? But those, are, those are almost two different things. Right. What are the distortions that destroy relationships? Right. That's A and B, you know, what is the number one thing? But I, I will say that this has nothing to do with, with Shadokha, but I would say that the number one distortion that destroys relationships is an expectation that you have to have justice and fairness 
it's actually uh, a, a terrible distortion. You can be very happily married and in a relationship with somebody and things are not going to be equal. Uh, behavior in marriage should be values-based. It shouldn't be reactive. Meaning that if you have somebody as your spouse, whatever values you have that dictate how you should behave towards your spouse, that should continue regardless of whatever treatment you're receiving. And it's really a halacha. It's, a, it's become in the Torah to withhold a chesed on the basis of how you were treated prior. People do it all the time. You're angry, somebody says something mean to you, the next morning your spouse says good morning to you and smile, and you go, hmm, it's the cover. If you're, you're supposed to spot, smile, and be kind and generous hearted to your spouse, you have to do it no matter what. If you don't want to be married to them, don't be married to them. It's not just a derisive to get divorced. It isn't just a derisive to do nakama. So that one of the greatest distortions is people in relationships are looking for fairness. That's not what you look for. What you look for is um, you understand what your, what your responsibilities and your roles and what behavior you want to do. You agree on it, and you do the best that you can without looking to see what the other one's doing. The, the need to exact revenge and to even and be tit for tat kills relationships. Um, I wanted to talk about technology since it was mentioned in the film. You talked about it. Obviously, we're living in a kind of new, kind of dating world with the advent of technology. I'm wondering how you think it's affecting Jewish dating, and whether you you see it, how you see it as helping, and how you see it as hindering the process. If you, if you do. I have been on the online dating sites for using Why You Connect, Why You Sinai. Um, for I guess now at least 10 years. Uh, so clearly not so effective. Um, but uh, I will say that I, I actually find that I, I still go on more dates when it's somebody who knows me and is setting me up. When I get an internet uh, suggestion and the paragraph is you know three, four sentences and the Shachan doesn't know who either of us are but thought, well, according to the algorithm you matched up, I'm much more hesitant to go out. And another thing that people don't think about, it's actually a safety hazard. I'm getting into a car with a stranger. Someone thinks someone told me many years ago, don't do. Um, and it's very um, hard to take a picture and a few sentences and say, should I go out with this person? And like I was saying before about resumes in general, everyone kind of sounds the same. So you think, okay, uh, maybe this isn't so bad. And then you speak to the person on, your, on the phone, and you're like, wow, you don't sound anything like your description. You're not outgoing or normal. Um, and that's a little weird. Um, and, and the other thing that's a problem, and, but at the same time, like I said before, with the rest of these, you can't fight it. You want to have your name out there. You want to be um, accessible to as many people as possible. You have to have an online resume. Um, and there are many, many organizations who are doing many shidduch each year through these online uh, websites. And it's, it's tremendously easier, from what I understand, for the Shev Hanan to have all these profiles accessible to them. Um, but the other point that I was going to say, but now it's a um, in terms of, oh yes, that I've actually gotten this, where someone will call me with the name, be like, check out his Facebook profile page. Why are you encouraging that? Now, granted, I, I don't have anything out there that I don't want to hide, that I would hide, because I wouldn't put it out there. But we're in the day and age where we're saying, Go judge a person by their status update, or by their picture, or by the latest YouTube video that they put up. Again, how is that going to tell me anything about the person that I'm supposed to want to date with? Um, so, it, uh, online dating hasn't been particularly successful for me, and honestly, I don't think it's been particularly successful for most of my friends. Um, I actually don't have any friends, except for one who got married and subsequently divorced, who met their match on a, on a website. Everyone else has met through friends or through the shop. So I personally like the old school way, or meeting people in person at events and Shabbat homes. That hasn't been a, a completely my experience. I agree that it's it's, um, it's much better to meet through introductions. But I I uh, I, I meet uh, brides and grooms all the time uh, because we have a lot of wedding seats that you know on the it. and usually they meet with the rabbi at some point before the wedding, and we've had a lot of couples who have met through online dating, many times they live in Thornhill, and they're just a few blocks away from each other. They never would have met or not had been gone online. Which brings me to another important point, and that is um, there are some dating services 
who provide so much information about compatibility that there are many people that are excluded that wouldn't normally necessarily be excluded. You know, I know this is controversial. I'm of the belief that even if one of the people is not Orthodox, but they are compatible, they should meet. And I know that there are a lot of people who don't agree with that, but I feel that if two people fall in love, like my mom and dad, my dad was not Orthodox when he met my mother, but my mother set down the rules, and she's been doing that for the last 60 years. She said, if we're going to get married, we have to have an Orthodox home, and our children have to be raised Orthodox, and we have to go to yeshiva. And my dad saw the value in it, even though he hadn't yet been ready to commit personally, and eventually that's the direction he went. And so, but that's an aside. The issue of Facebook, I feel that if you're in a Parsha, especially if you're a young lady, you better make sure that every single photo that is in your Facebook page is flattering. Because even though it may be a very, a photo that you're very fond of, because it represents a memory that you cherish of that time when you were underneath that waterfall or with your friends and you were all sweaty and dirty, but it was just the most exhilarating moment. But you got to know that the guy that may be interested in you is going to be checking out your Facebook profile. So if you look horrible, you've just done yourself a disservice. So if you're going to use Facebook, make sure you use it responsibly. I'm actually not on Facebook. Thank God I have real friends. If anybody wants to get to know me, they can't check my Facebook file. They're just going to have to get to know me. There are no shortcuts. I think it's better that way. In terms of the question that you asked, modern tools give people more options, give people more choices. I think in principle it's a good thing if they're handled responsibly. It's good that people have choices. It's good that people can go on a dating website and there's 50,000 singles to choose from. And they can do simple searches and more advanced searches and have all these filtering mechanisms that are really not very helpful. It's good that it's made the world a smaller place, that people who live very far away and never meet each other can in theory meet each other. But I think it's being used in a very primitive fashion. And that's one of the things that I'm trying to change. Again, I think that the role of the shotgun can be beneficial. I think the role of websites can be beneficial, but they're not being used intelligently. They're not being used in a helpful way. What do you think is the best way for people to meet each other? Naturally. And naturally doesn't mean singles events, because there's nothing natural about a singles event. Nothing natural or pleasant whatsoever, and that's why they don't work. That's why people wouldn't go to singles events if they knew they wouldn't meet anybody to date. It's not natural. They wouldn't be there. A natural program, that's what I tried to bring back with End the Madness. The rule of thumb I have is if the singles could look into a crystal ball and see they would not meet anybody to date or marry at a program, would they still go? If the answer is yes, then you have a winning program. Why would they go? It's an educational opportunity. It's fun. It's a chesed opportunity. There's something valuable about the experience itself that they want to be there. And that'll bring out the best sides of their personality. The people that they meet there, they will naturally have something in common with. They'll naturally have something to talk about. It'll be a positive experience even if they don't meet somebody. Whereas a typical singles event is you hear somebody like me talk for a while, then you have a table of refreshments, and then you have to introduce yourself with this awkward small talk. Hi, my name is Moshe. Where are you from? What do you do? And you do that 50 times, over and over and over again, trying to get married somehow. It's not natural and it doesn't work. And there's always that couple that somehow meets, and that makes it worthwhile. See, those two people met, so everybody else should keep on going to these things. Maybe they'll be the next lucky lottery. It's not, it's not natural. It's not normal, and it causes singles to get frustrated and bitter and burned out. It doesn't work. Natural events are things that people would do otherwise. This is a natural event. These people are here not because they're single and they're desperately looking, although some people may be, but it's not obvious by virtue of the fact that they're here, right? So everybody in this room has something in common. They're interested in this topic. They care about the topic. It's something that we can talk about. It's something that can bring people closer together, and therefore it's, it's, it's a good way for people to meet. These are the things that we need to bring back. One of the things you saw lamented on the video was the, um, a closure of venues for young men and women to meet each other. And I have made the recommendation, I'd like to make it publicly, if you're making a wedding at the Bayant, for God, thank God for a child who's getting married, do a tremendous chesed for all of the boys' friends and all of the girls' friends, and have mixed tables for the same. <laughs> Yeah.
I mean, if, if for some reason, because of social pressure from Rabbi so and so, it's pasnish and tornish, you can't do it, then at least make a sweet table when the rabbi leaves, just for <laughs> some
particularly when you're dealing with compulsive addictive behavior, whether it's alcoholism, gambling, or sexual compulsions, the more you keep it a secret, the more you strengthen the, the urge and the compulsion. So there are real, there are real challenges uh, to somebody with uh, an addiction in their past not to, not to divulge that, because in some ways it might set the person up for further relapse. On the other hand, though, you, you need a community that has to understand the reality of mental illness and conditions and not rule somebody out because of, because of their, their past. And so this has to be thought through very carefully. I mean, from a halakhic point of view, you know, the correct way is that, that it's fair game. People could find that in anything they want. You don't have to reveal it. But as the relationship turns to becoming very serious, you do need to speak about things that are, uh, that are significant. And um, again, Rav Moshe has a tube about this too. It, he says that once there's a context and you know the person, you know their miles and their chasronos, you know, then you have the ability to, to decide whether this person's right for you. You don't reveal all the problems at the beginning. And maybe that's part of the distortion of trying to answer all the questions before people can get out of the starting gate. But I do think that, that it is important that it is a very serious problem before you get engaged. This needs to be discussed. And you have to trust the people to be adults and to understand context and understand merit and understand what it means. Because you can think you're marrying somebody who's totally fine, and has no family history of anything, the next day they can get hit by a bus. You know, it could cost a show, but we can't control our futures. So we need to we need to take things with a grain of salt. But people do need to be honest about 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 serious flaws. Uh, I'd like to follow up on that. Um, so that seems perfectly sound to me. You know, you have some serious issues, you have to be concerned about them. What's confusing to me about this process, and here I'll actually speak as a bal what's very strange to me about this process is the linking of a person's own being to the people around them. In other words, I see lots of talk about, I can't go out with her because of her sister, because of her mother, because of her grandfather, because of her uncle. If I was going to be judged that way, I wouldn't have gotten married. You know, it's, in other words, I am who I am. My family is who they are. I love them. They're not from. Um, and, you know, I've lived various kinds of lives and deal with it. Or don't deal with it. But it seems very odd to me that the essence of a human being is being judged by people around us that we can somehow control. We don't choose our families. We don't choose our, our past in some level. They are what they are. Why should this be a factor in a boy meets girl, find out of each other, decide, flesh it out, find out about your families, go through all the raw stuff, and decide. Why should that be in any way involved? I don't think it has to be. I think that it really depends on, 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 on who you are and, and, and in your context. The, the, we're progressing, right? The Western man is much more an individual, right? I can tell you that my grandfather never, in his whole life, asked himself how he's feeling. <laughs> and I don't know if he was happy or not, but he never asked himself. He saw himself as an extension of, a, of an experience. He actually was a, a grandchild of a, of, a, of a rabbi, and he himself, was, if it wasn't for the Holocaust, would have been one himself. And he, he never asked himself that question. In fact, it was such a difference, you know, the, the self-other differentiation, which we call pathological, if it doesn't exist, but a lot of its context. If I would disagree with him, it wasn't that he heard that I was disagreeing. It's like if your right hand starts disagreeing with your left hand. It's, he simply did not hear it. It'd be impossible that I would disagree with him. I'm just a part of the chain. So, you know, the, the, the identity and the way, the, way, the way identities form is very different for different people from different cultures. And as I mentioned before, we're in transition. So it really does depend, right? If you're, if you're somebody from a traditional background, the family has a tremendous amount of influence on you, positively and negatively, and people have a right to want to, to want to factor that in. Is it wise? Is it always true? You don't have to go further than the Talmud. You know, one of the greatest love stories of all time is, you know, Raphael sees Rabbi Akiva, who himself is, a, is an unlettered, although very fine in some ways, but unlettered person, literally an unlettered person. And she comes from this family with all the yuchas and all the wealth, and she puts her foot down and says, this is the man for me. And this, is, this, this, this story is celebrated in Gemara, although very cognitive, dissonantly not celebrated in yeshivas. All the Gemara said, don't fit into the worldview or issue. 
But she makes a stand and says, I want to marry him. Her father doesn't go for it at all, and you know that he, he resorts to cut off, which is oftentimes a strategy of families that do have poor self love and differentiation. They choose, you don't exist. So Kabul Subhua said Rabbi Kiva and Rabbi do not exist anymore, and let them starve, right? But, but, the, but so I, I think the answer is we have to decide that. But the information needs to be disclosed, and families have to figure out what they stand for. Values count. Your values, your family's values, but these are part of values. How much do you take into account an individual? Yeah. yeah. If the strategy is to con somebody into marrying you under false pretenses and hope that somehow it'll work out down the road, then by all means, people can answer the questions the way they're expected to answer the questions, go out on a minimal number of tightly scripted dates, follow the script very, very closely, and then uh, qualified people like Robert Foreman can help them pick up the pieces when things start going sour, because they probably will at some point. I don't think that's the best approach. And frankly, I feel very sorry for somebody who is in a marriage but has never been able to share his true self with the person that he's living with and supposedly sharing life with because he's afraid of not being accepted. What a, what a lonely, dark place that must be to live in. What, what terrible suffering, what a burden that person must be carrying every moment of his life where he's hiding from his spouse, which would be the closest person in his life to him. I don't know why anybody would choose that as, as a first choice. Now, of course, there's a time and a place and a context for sharing certain things. But ultimately, I think everybody wants to be loved for who they really are, flaws and all, and there's a time and place to share these sensitive things, and that will bring people closer to one another. There are halakhic parameters to what can be revealed, but they really, it's beyond the scope of this discussion. But if people have questions, they can call their up. I would like to uh, finish with, um, in a way, the question that interests me personally the most. Um, there seems to be a kind of paradox. I'm thinking here about Jewish people getting married today in the Orthodox world. Almost a kind of a perfect storm. And the perfect storm sort of goes like this. Jewish law forbids premarital sexuality, which would seem to then encourage early marriage as a means of fulfilling perfectly natural and healthy sexual desire, especially males. On the other hand, we all know that in modernity, there's been a vast sociological shift in which people are marrying later. And they're marrying later for very identifiable reasons because there's longer years spent in study, either in yeshiva or in universities or other academic institutions. They're getting degrees, they're establishing careers. And many singles say they would not be ready to marry younger, even from the point of view of emotional readiness and financial stability and so on. So that to me is a paradox, which you know I guess you can solve if your parents have a lot of money and they're going to support you, um, or you meet the love of your life when you're 18 years old. But otherwise, I, I'm sort of curious, like how do we solve this paradox, right? You've, you've got sex on the one side, but you've got non-readiness on the other side. And if, you, if you're solving it by just saying, okay, I jumped in, I'm 20, I'll jump in anyway. Um, there's probably going to be some kind of fallout on the other end if you're not ready. So how, how would you sort of see this? Anybody? Yeah, I, know, sort of. I think it's certainly ideal for people to get married young if they're able to. I don't think anybody should get married one day before they are ready. Now, who is ever really ready for marriage? We don't know what marriage is until we experience it. So nobody's totally ready, but you're close to being ready. That's when people should get married. There's no magic number in terms of age. It varies from, from person to person. But people who are not yet ready should be, you know, striving and working to get ready as soon as possible, just as they're working on other life goals, whether it's schooling, jobs, etc. This should be at the top of the list of things to do. This is one of this is really the most important thing. My Rebbe, Rabbi Moshe Tendler, many years ago at the very first End the Madness event, which is uh, available online on the website, and I strongly encourage everybody to, to listen to the audio of that. He said that uh, young couples, when they get married, they start off at the bottom. They're not necessarily going to have a large apartment and it's them on a silver platter. They're not necessarily going to have a lot of money. They've got to start at the bottom and work their way up. That's what their parents and grandparents did. You don't wait until you're already established and then you get married. You have to start off and grow with the person. So I think people should try to get ready as early as possible and navigate the other challenges in life with that partner and kind of figure things out. I think that's the best way to do it. Um, I think the greatest success of traditional Judaism is the ban on premarital sex. <coughs> The reason why I believe that is because that's the reason 
the very fact that that taboo does not exist in general society is why the institution of marriage has been broken down in society. Because, quite simply, without the sexual tension and desire that a young man, especially a young man, and to a certain degree a young woman has to be intimate with someone else, if you were to speak to an alien who just came to this planet from somewhere foreign, somewhere outside of the planet Earth, and tried to explain to them the institution of marriage and said, we have this thing where you give another person a ring who's totally not from your family and say that you have to take care of each other for the rest of your lives, for no reason other than the fact that you made that promise to each other. The alien would say, why? What's the point? And the reason why marriage works, has worked in civilization, is because a big part of it is the sexual component to it. I believe that every human being is driven to a very large degree by their sexuality, and the reason why some people get married young is because of that desire, and if the desire is great enough, you'll figure out a way to surmount the financial challenges and the emotional challenges that you may have. There are people, I think, who don't allow their sexuality to play the role that it's supposed to play in incentivizing them to enter into a marriage because the scariness and the fear of entering into a commitment outweighs the sexual desire. So I would just suggest that we should emphasize the taboo on sex before marriage, and we'll have more marriages in Kali Surah. I have a different thought, but I'm going to talk about normal urges, normal basic human desire. I think that the mistake that we've made, actually, is not recognizing the normalness of sexual desire. And there is, what does it mean not to be ready to be married? It certainly doesn't mean being able to earn a living. Clearly, whether we approve this lifestyle or not, there are people from several different cultures who marry and have oodles of children without the scintilla of an ability to support themselves, from Jewish culture and from the secular culture. What I'm trying to say is being ready to be married is an emotional piece. It's a decision, and it also takes certain emotional skills, the ability to relate to another, the ability to shoulder responsibilities. Communities, whether you're from the modern Orthodox community or you're from the Yeshiva community, needs to acknowledge that we need to be realistic about what it takes to help a couple succeed. And there's no way that a firm couple can succeed without some parental help and get married at an early age. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing shameful about that. It might be insane to think that you have to support ten children who still are not earning a living, but the idea that they need help and should get help and we should devote ourselves toward that, that's a wonderful thing. It's an artificial distinction that until you support yourself 100%, first of all, the firm world with tuition and camp and everything, poverty level is $150,000, $200,000 a year. This is ridiculous. You can't do it. I think the whole firm community actually is being supported by one 99-year-old Holocaust survivor who made a million dollars selling things from China or something. I don't even know how the firm community supports itself. But the point is, I don't think it's a problem. I think it's a solution. We need to normalize it and encourage people. They can get married and come up with practical solutions for couples to support themselves and get support and get education and get training. They don't need to be supported forever. There's no shame that couples need help to start out. They all do. I just want to add one piece in terms of deciding when one is ready to get married. I think it's a decision that a young person should make with the help of their parents and not their friends. I think that social peer pressure plays a large role in when someone decides that they're ready to get married. I remember I was trying to bed and my friends had gone back to Stern already and they started dating and I was freaking out because I thought, oh my gosh, I'm going to come back. There's not going to be anybody left. And I'm still in seminary. How come they're getting married? And I certainly was not ready to get married at that stage. And I don't even know if I was ready to get married when I was 20 or 21. And who knows? Maybe if I would have, I would have been married. Whatever. But the point is that I think that often kids or single people turn to their friends for advice in these situations because they don't want to talk to their parents about it. 
but the problem is why don't they want to talk to their parents about it? And it might be the way that the conversation is coming up. And I know that I have friends who do not talk to their parents at all about dating. They will not talk about it because that's the one thing that they fight about. And we need to avoid finding ourselves in those contentious conversations. And I think that to an extent, my generation of people who are single is, is a phenomenon because the people who are a generation or two generations older than us did not have this huge number of single people and therefore their parents did not deal with it the same way or know how to deal with it. And I mean, my, I mentioned before, I have a younger sister who's getting married, my second younger sister who's getting married, and it's Shem soon, and my mom is beside herself that I am not married. Now, it doesn't matter how many times I tell her, Mom, it's going to be okay. You know, and the thing is, is that to an extent, her feeling so bad for something she has nothing to really do with makes me feel worse. But again, it's the, the approach of the conversation because when she says it's just coming from a place of love, but I don't resent the fact that she's crying herself to sleep more than I'm crying myself to sleep. You know, and I think that it's important that when it comes to starting to date and going through this process, that you ask your child, when do you want to talk about it? Not, I want to talk to you about it per se. I'm not a parent, I'm just a child. But I do think that it's a very weird and new relationship for so many people that it's, it's hard to navigate. But I think that kids get very defensive and therefore don't necessarily talk about it when really the parent is the best person to talk to about it. Uh, if you want to ask a question of the panel, I suggest you line up behind the mic because I'm going to turn to you in just a minute. Um, last piece, uh, quick, 30 seconds, best piece of dating advice. Best piece of dating advice. I'm not into sound bites, but I'll give you one. Be real and be normal. That's all I've got. Just, just be your real self and trust in Hashem and trust in yourself and trust in the people who care about you that you'll find somebody who loves you just the way you are. You don't have to play some sick game. Just be real and be normal. Okay. Good job. <laughs> Spend some time preparing yourself for the date and make yourself look nice. <laughs> I'll give you the sound bites. Um, one is come with a plan. I, I do not like getting into the car and the guy's like, uh, so what do you want to do tonight? I don't know. What do you want to do tonight? Have a plan. And number two is be careful with the kinds of questions that you ask of a single person. I don't ask you personal questions about your marital relationship. You don't have to ask me super personal questions. Look for somebody that you genuinely enjoy spending time with. We're going to be spending a lot of time together. <laughs> uh, let's give a warm hand to our panel. What I've concluded this evening is there's no way I can date today. Uh, go ahead. Oh, yeah, it's showtime. Um, hello, panel. Um, I uh, have a question. I remember that um, earlier in the panel you mentioned about um, how people are being too uh, picky when it comes to finding a date or a shit of. Um, I uh, am looking for someone who has certain interests as I am, but it might be uh, a bit hard to find someone with that interest in the Orthodox Jewish community. So um, to find someone with something that I have in common with the person that isn't so common in the Orthodox Jewish community, um, would that be uh, a little too picky? All right, you got to tell us what it is. <laughs> no, you don't. That's personal. Good <laughs> couple. I can't tell you what to do, but I can tell you what the research shows. The research does show that happily married couples do not have to enjoy the same things. However, that's a very big, that's a very big but. The, the but is that they, that they do need to feel that the other person truly is interested and supports their goals. So you can have somebody, you can have a, a relative married to a, a titan on Wall Street, and they can come home for dinner together, and she can talk about how she taught her students this great Rashi, and you can talk about how we just merged three companies and, and laid off. 300 people, <laughs> and it sounds strange, but if they truly, really care about the other person's life goals, and that is partially a natural inclination and partially a decision. Marriage is a decision of loyalty, and, and, and it's not fake, and, and they show real concern and interest, 
that relationship can be successful. Having said that, of course, it's nice to share things in common, and you can look for those things. But I'm just telling you what the research shows. Anybody else? Next step up. Yeah, sure. Picky is a, is a very loaded word. Uh, if you're going to spend the rest of your life with somebody and build a home and a family with them, I think you should be picky. Just be picky about the right things and not the wrong things. Be picky about values, personality, character, you actually enjoy each other's company, you like each other, you care about each other. Those are the things that you should be picky about. Everything else is really flexible. Uh, and, and, and in terms of shared interests, I think it's a bonus, but it's really not a uh, it's really not a requirement. I personally love softball. I would not expect my wife to you know join me in every softball game and watch her because she cares. And she likes opera. <clears throat> Maybe I'll go once in a while just because that's what you have to do. But hopefully she has other <laughs> friends to fill that void in her life. That's not the responsibility of the staff. Many of us in this room have secret hobbies. Than many other Orthodox Jews might not have. <laughs> uh, okay, we're, we're, we're listening. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's a simple well, I'll, 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 I, I don't mind sharing it. I, uh, you know, I, I, when I was growing up, I was I was madly into comic books, and so I, my wife and I first got married. I said, you know, my idea of a good, good vacation is to go to comic book shops on, uh, when, we go to, when we go to various desti vacation destinations and see what I can find, you know. And so um, she was, she, my, my wife was fine with that. She, she'll go, she'll look for jewelry and I'll look for my comic book. <laughs> you know, if you like wearing Star Wars memorabilia and waving this lightsaber around in front of the camera, and that's your idea of a fun time. And, you know, first get to know the girl, let her get to know you. I think a lot of women would find that charming, that, you know, there's a little quirk about a guy that, you know, okay, so you're not the conventional guy. Conventionality is overrated. I have a question here. My question is in the realm of uh, meeting singles. I know some of you agree that it's the only avenue to meet singles at single events. But always appears that way that, like for my lady friends, that there's a lot more men um, at the, I mean, sorry, the opposite. There's a lot more women at the single events, right? So do you think that's part of the shift, right? part of the problem, the shift crisis? And um, also, do you think, um, you know, why, is, why do you think that there's more women than men? Is it maybe women more serious and men are less serious? This is also, I'm happy to tell you, this is also a myth and it's propaganda. I'm actually able to demonstrate it and tell you why. I'm not a scientist, but I think I can give you a pretty reasonable answer to this, okay? There are not more women than men out there. There's plenty of guys out there. God knows how many of you he put into the world and he knows what he's doing. I trust his, his counting mechanism. <laughs> I once ran a program many years ago. I thought it was very clever. It was called Speed Chess. And I advertised it. I was really proud of myself. Speeding is fun, but not legal. Chess is legal but not fun. Speed chess, legal and fun. And it was a speed chess tournament with the clocks and everything around Robin, where everybody would play a quick game of chess with everybody else in the room, and then we'd give them an opportunity to meet. And the proceeds of the event would go to the charity of the winner's choice. So there was a chesed component built into it. It was something different. It was fun. It was clever. Approximately 20 guys showed up, not one woman. <laughs> so if there was a shotgun in the room, they'd say, wow, there's so many great guys, but they're all women. And the guys were really good guys, by the way. They were educated. They were personable. They were really good people. And if women showed up to this event, they would have been very pleased with who they found. So I went on my website, and I blasted the women, but you're not supposed to do it. You're supposed to always have sympathy. And I said, where were you tonight? Why didn't you come? And they, and they yelled back at me, well, we, we're women. We don't like to play chess. I said, well, you're willing to go to the shops and play that game. You're willing to post a personal game on the internet. But playing a game of chess to meet a guy, that's just crossing all boundaries. I can't do that. That's just uncomfortable for me. I think the reason why your typical singles event has more women than men, and your typical shop knows more women than men, and your typical singles website has more women signed up than men, which leads to a perception that there are more women than men, is because it caters to the female mindset. I'm not interested in having a good experience I'd actually rather have no fun whatsoever. I want to get right down to business, have a really rotten time at this event, but you know how to get out of here. <laughs> that caters to the female mindset. The guy wants to get married too, but he wants to relax. You know, I want to have a good time. I want to get to know somebody gradually. I'd rather avoid all that pressure and awkwardness. So guys shy away from these things. 
And since all the all, all that's being offered to singles right now is stuff that's full of pressure and awkwardness that caters to the female mindset, I just want to get married and get right down to business. So the men kind of shy away from it, and that leads to a perception that there are not a lot of single guys. They're out there. Just give them an opportunity for something that's relaxing and enjoyable, and they'll come. And now begins the war of the roses. <laughs> Thank you, Sananda, for that opening. Um, as the woman on this panel, um, I, I just want to say my favorite pastime is attending singles events. I mean, I don't know who doesn't love to go to those. Um, I like to have fun. I do also want to get married. Um, I don't know if I would have seen an advertised event of playing chess I would have gone because I don't know how to play chess. And that's a little intimidating to me, and I don't think that that does sound fun. If you had a bowling event or you had some activity that I like to do, then maybe I would attend. But that doesn't mean that um, I don't think your event is important or that I want to get married any less. So I'm not sure exactly if it's catering to the women the way that events are run. Um, I do think that when we say there are more women at events or more women in, in Shah Khan and, uh, you know, folders, it's because I don't often think that, uh, from what I understand, and I won't speak on behalf of men, that men don't need the service as much because perhaps they're getting more phone calls than the average woman is, or they're able to, they're, they are meeting people more naturally than, than girls are, who, like I said earlier, are not going to go up to somebody and ask them out, whereas a man might feel more comfortable doing that. And I don't think that um, any event is really played towards either gender that I've ever attended. I think that people want to get people into a room so that people will meet and people will get married. That doesn't mean that the right people are in the right room for each other, which could be the problem. And I think that um, it's something that Rabbi Krupkin said earlier about if someone's a little bit less religious, then you can still set them up. I don't think that that's the case today. I think that we're living in a very different time than when your parents were dating because we've become so siloed and we've been forced to check things off on a checkoff list where I identify, and therefore we've taught ourselves not to be flexible. So I don't disagree with you in theory, but unfortunately, I'm not going to go to an event that's for modern Orthodox light. I'm only going to go to an event that's modern Orthodox Machmir because that's who I am. And I think that's a big problem, but that's that's what I'm supposed to do. But that also may address why there's a perception of more ladies than men is because the ladies on their checklist say the guy's got to dab him three times a day, he's got to be Kobe'i to the Torah, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There are plenty of guys, but they're not into learning. And uh, sometimes they do sleep in, and they don't go to men all the time. So the, my question to you is, is that a reason to puzzle the guy? So I'm going to talk from very, very personal experience. If I was getting the number of men offered to that people might think that I am, that I was turning down, that I would say, okay. But I will literally get a suggestion once every six months. I'm 30 years old. How am I gonna get married if I'm getting a suggestion once every six months? You wanna send me up with someone who doesn't doubt me three times a day? I'll go out with him as long as he's a good guy. Because I wanna get married. But the problem is, is that people are not actually setting people up often enough, or people are not meeting often enough. And there are wonderful shakhanas out there who are banging their heads against the walls trying to set people up, but it's not happening. And I, I do think that people at this stage in their lives, and I'm talking about people who are in their late 20s and 30s and 40s, are much more willing to go out with people who are different than the hashkafically. But it's not even becoming an option because people aren't introducing them. And that's a really big problem. Mm -hmm. Just to make you just to say something humorous first, quickly. We're actually I always tell my friends that it's the men are under the rocks, hiding the rocks, and that's where they are. I see. <laughs> first of all, I want to say thank you. This is a really important topic, and one that I care a lot about, so I want to thank you all for being here. It sounds to me, and it seems to me like a lot of people are not being taught. They may be being taught Torah. They're not being taught things that make them more mature. They're not being taught midos enough. I don't see enough of an emphasis on that. And a lot of times in the Orthodox world, it seems like they're not being taught um, whatever it is that will keep them from being socially awkward so that they can approach and date in a healthy, respectful, comfortable, fun way. Another thing that I, I think is a problem, I just want to get your response to this, if any of this resonates with anything. Can I, can I take that point right there? So Please. I want to redirect that into a question for, for you, because you talked before about um, 
you know, Daniel Coleman talks about emotional intelligence and a certain social skill set, and it does seem sometimes that, that because of this kind of separation of the sexes, that this kind of emotional skill set is a bit of a deficit. And I'm wondering if you, if, uh, I think the questioner is asking, like, we need to, to like, model and teach this stuff more. What, what do you think? I think that's absolutely true. Um, the, the degree of gender separation, I think all of us in the room are reacting to, and somehow again it's a caricature of, of, of a Jewish idea that, that has its place but has gone, has gone amok. I only can tell you, you know, what my wife and I did, uh, and, we've, and we've always done. Um, since we've already married two off, so, you know, if they find out about it, probably do okay anyway, just on the inertia. But um, what we, you know, we did is we, we always encouraged not to have, you know, just fraternization, but we encouraged if different families got together for Shabbos and there were boys and girls and there were other people, they would talk of all ages. Uh, we, we never got all uptight about that, even though we're from, I would say, a more right-wing yeshivish background, because we felt that you got to learn how to talk to each other. You just have to. So if there was different Torah at the table, we'd encourage exchange, we'd look forward to those opportunities, we wouldn't, we, we, we wouldn't um, let things get out of hand. We really felt that that was important, and that there wouldn't be an awkwardness. And I think that, that there, is a, there, there is a problem in, in Tafasta, in Barugal, not Tafasta. You try to go too far in something, you really don't, you really don't achieve the desired results. So, uh, and, I, and I think that it always was mingling of sexes. Uh, you know, it's very clear. I don't think people in in places. So that's my personal you know, reaction to it. There's a hysterical video called "Things Not to Say on a Shidduch Day." It's on YouTube. I recommend it if you want to see a caricature of social awkwardness. If there's such a long line of people, we're going to limit it to one one at a time. You know, my sorry. The other part that I was really short, really important. Really, it's a long line. I just want to applaud, I want to applaud the caliber of speakers tonight. Thank you very much. <laughs> just, um, also, I see um, intermarriage as a crisis. And my question is now, speaking to Elisa's point, um, I find many people are reluctant to fix people up because they're afraid of the consequences if it doesn't work out. Um, and they just don't want to get involved. What would you say to those people? I have a quick line that I learned from someone who got married when she was in her late 30s. Love me a little less, set me up a little more. <laughs> <laughs> the word I hear so much tonight is about shit up is fear. Fear of rejection, fear of being hurt, fear of what the other person will say or think or getting involved. You know what, dating hurts. Sometimes you have to allow yourself to be hurt in order to find love. That's part of life, that's part of growing up, and you just gotta get over it, otherwise you shouldn't be dating. That's part of life. Okay, we're just gonna have a couple more, because the uh, hour is late. Yeah, um, one of the local rabbis, Rabbi Weber, he, he, he mentioned that he had hosted a bunch of guys in their mid to later 20s one Friday evening, and they told him that they were afraid to get married. And uh, I asked him about it, and he said um, many of them had friends who were in horrific marriages, and some were in horrific divorces. And so, it, what you what, what you touched upon, Rabbi, was that the mother-in-law from hell. I mean, the fact is, I think there are, there are people out there who are, have personality disorders who are dysfunctional, maybe because of their parents or because of other situations. And I'd like to. I, I just want to mention that I think it would be very beneficial if therapists like you went into the high school, the girls high schools and the yeshiva and taught the kids what to look for, the red flags that would show them that maybe the person they're dating could have a personality disorder or some significant flaw that would not make them a healthy uh, relationship. And this way they'll have more confidence to go when they date, to recognize problematic people, and then they might not be so afraid of falling in. Thank you. One more, if there is one more. That's it, we're good? Thank you all very much for coming. And the shoes coming.
I'm Karnas Sassan Vesimcha, and on behalf of the organization, I really want to thank Tor in Motion for giving us the opportunity to speak. We're a volunteer organization based and founded over 15 years ago when a local group of women recognized that there was a problem looming in the Orthodox Jewish community with regard to marriage in Toronto. Basically, they looked around and saw the most amazing young people who were accomplished, well-groomed, and of fine character. Yet somehow, they were not finding what they were looking for. As a result, the Sassan Simcha organization was set up with a mandate to promote Orthodox Jewish family life through education, programming, organizing events, Shabbatons, and counseling to help foster solid marriages among our local singles. Sassan Simcha is the only non-profit organization of its kind in Canada and works to serve singles worldwide. Our real goal is to help the local community. Definitely, our first focus is Toronto. As we've seen, many people are disturbed by the very notion of the term shit up crisis. They believe that perhaps that's an over-exaggeration. Our response to that is simply, look around you and see how many families are in deep distress because their children are getting older and they have not yet found what they're looking for. Moreover, this is not simply an individual family's problem. It is a problem for the entire Jewish community and its continuity. The family is the focal point of Jewish life, without which our very survival as a people and certainly as an Orthodox community is threatened. Here in Toronto, the facts that are that in the right-wing Orthodox community, the vast majority of boys leave home at an early age, certainly for post-high school studies. They go out of town to Yeshivot, either in the States or in Israel, and many don't return. There are so many girls in the communities where they're learning that these boys find themselves with no need to return home to find a wife. The girls that remain behind in Toronto have a very small pool from which to choose. This has serious implications for the future viability of our local community. Yet even in the more modern Orthodox community, where more of the girls do go out of town, the problem of too many singles not getting married also exists. Thus, we need to consider sociological factors and not just geographic ones. For example, what was stated before, the strict separation of the sexes among the Yishik community, as well as the abundant of choice in the more modern communities, often result in a lack of social skills in the one group and the inability to commit in the other. We are also clearly impacted by society around us and the pervasive influence of the media, Hollywood, Twitter, Facebook, magazines, billboards, has created a false impression of what life, particularly married life, is all about. Unfortunately, we are also now seeing a rising rate in divorce, alcoholism, gambling addiction, wife, and even child abuse. All of these influences are singles. They are already nervous to make lifelong decisions, and they do need our help navigating their personal journeys. The right-wing Orthodox community has been using the Shatchen system for generations and are very familiar with the role that the parents should play. This system works when the singles are young, but it breaks down when, as they get older and more independent. The modern Orthodox parent and the Balchuva parent is often at a complete loss as to how to best support this aspect of their children's lives. If they're fortunate, their children find what they're looking for by themselves, or through a friend or mentor, or the parents have a large enough social network that they are able to help. However, there are thousands who don't have access to such resources and the parents only realize that there is an, even a problem when their daughters are reaching their late 20s or 30s and are still single. This is indeed where our organization wants to be of assistance. In recent years, we have embraced modern technology with an online website where our singles can register. It's not a regular online dating site as no one except our um, at people have access to their profiles. No one can see who's actually registered on the site. We only allow access to carefully selected and qualified individuals who volunteer and have been specifically trained for their role that they are to play. 
We are connected to Sayud Sinai YU Connects Nevada. There are over 20,000 singles registered. Admittedly, two thirds are women. And from these, on our own site, we have 60, and we have access to those 20,000 across the world. Through our database, we have been very lucky and very fortunate. We've been exceedingly successful with this approach, and people have met other individuals they would never have met otherwise. In the past few months, we've had at least three shidduchim for three couples, all in their late 30s and 40s. In addition to our database online shut and center approach, we serve a membership of over a thousand singles offline through lectures, events, shabbatons, and counseling, as well as the traditional shatvin process. We run age-appropriate singles events to try and help singles meet in a more natural and relaxed way. Very often from our events, couples are formed between individuals that we not have, we would not have thought of putting together. In essence, we're only the messenger for Hashem's matchmaking. The whole process of making Shaduchim is not an exact science. It's, yes, it's a possibly a click of a button, but there's a whole range of people and different individuals require different approaches. We try to be sensitive to the feelings and needs of each individual in the pursuit of finding their soulmate. Hopefully by the end of this evening, you will have a clear insight into the circumstances today's Jewish singles are facing. And so I beseech you to ask yourselves if there's any way you can help, because each and every one of us can really make a huge difference. We are always in need of volunteers. So if you have an interest, please feel free to fill out the on, uh, volunteer sheets we've left at the front outside. And you, or else you can reach us through the community director if you are listed. By volunteering to help us, whether as an online matchmaker, hosting a Shub's lunch meal for singles, or hosting a citywide matchmaking session, your efforts will be richly rewarded. I've personally seen firsthand as many of our own volunteers have come into the office after having helped so many singles looking for their Bashert and announced that miraculously they too have been richly rewarded by a wonderful chef for their own divorced daughter, their 40 plus year old son. So I ask everyone present to get whatever you can to help and everyone to also get singles to register online with us. We promise to do our best to help, but in the final analysis, Everything is Bidesha Mai, and we can only try, but we all must try. Thank you.